You okay? Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. I have to say, I am I'm still a little reeling from Chris's presentation over there. Um, it's uh, it's pretty powerful, and it's difficult to process that. But um, what I'd like to start off with today is I'd like to uh, show you a video. And this video is all about innovation and how happy accidents to, can lead to some amazing innovations. I don't actually see anything, so I don't know. I think we, we all need a little light moment for a second. <laughs> OK. Tinker had the pompadour, the Air Max, ducks and pipes, exposed, naked colors, pinks, blues, greens, angry French, happy runners, a bigger air saw, more cushion, longer runs, inspiration. That exact second an idea synapse fires, and there's not enough time to get it all on paper before it's gone. Forever. How do you get it back? Experiment. Play like the Sphere React stuff and the slits in paper, uninhibited like a kid. Genius, simple, huge, let the athlete breathe. Huh. Breathe. Air. Breath, breathing, steam. James Watts, did he invent the light bulb? Nope, steam engine. I can't draw trains. I can draw shoes, but I can't draw a decent train. This looks like a tractor. He got the idea from a jangling kettle lid. Insane. Think, think, think. Steam liners plus railroads equals smaller world. Steam was the internet. Simple is big, simple is huge. Connect two things. One plus one equals three. I never got what that meant. Connect. Like Dunlop and the tire with the hose and the trike. Change cars forever. What if it had been rubber roads? Nope, Dunlop had it right. Just a tire, obvious. Tire, wheel, spin, spinning, movement, motion, air court motion. From our rigger canoe, support and balance and stability shorten distance. Like the phone. Huge idea, total accident. The real invention was tuning forks making vowel sounds. Forks that can talk. Forks. Barbs, claws, cotton gin, tiny thing, massive change, small is big, the whole industrial revolution from a cat swiping at a bird. bird. Feathers down, floating, dandelion, a hike in the woods, burrs, burrs on socks, I hate that. Velcro, no more laces, air kikini, simplicity, strip it to the core, always lighter and faster like kikini messengers, could run across the big island so fast their fish were still alive. Huh. Halt. Humid heat, tropics, heat equals mosquitoes, mosquitoes bring malaria. Gory thought that keeping the hospital cold would keep patients free from malaria. The idea didn't cure malaria, but made the fridge. I'm kind of hungry. Kitchen, pop tarts, waffles, syrup, focus. Waffle maker, rubber, not for lunch, Bowerman. Bowerman, faster runners. How'd he see that? I love that video. The reason why I love that video is it talks about innovation and how innovation isn't a linear process. It's all about a series of happy accidents. You know, and that's what I love about being here at PopTech is because PopTech brings together all different kinds of technologies, all different kinds of people, all different ways of thinking about things. And that's what, what makes it so great to be here. You know, we are looking at one of the biggest problems we've ever had to focus on at Nike, and that is moving from the industrial economy to the green economy. You know, and every time I say this word green economy, it kind of makes me laugh, you know, because I see it everywhere. I see it in newspapers, I see it in magazines, I see it on TV, as if there is some roadmap to this green economy. 
But the truth is, there is no roadmap, and everybody is just making it up. So what I'm going to share with you today, I'm going to share with you our journey at Nike to move to the green economy. And so the first area that we really focused on is we focused on reductions. And before you focus on reducing your footprint, you have to understand what it is, right? So our four largest environmental footprints at Nike is waste, water, toxics, and energy. Those are our four largest footprint. And we have spent a lot of time focusing on reducing that footprint. You know, we really started with waste. And for us, we've been able to reduce our manufacturing waste and footwear 50% from where it was 10 years ago. And two thirds of that waste is recycled. We also are very close to reaching our goal of reducing packaging by 30%. At the same time, we've had our reuse issue program up and running for over 20 years, where we've been able to take back over 20 million pairs of shoes and turn them into over 300 sports surfaces. So we've done a lot of work around waste. We've also focused around energy as well. So as a company, we've been able to reduce our greenhouse gases 18% from where they were 10 years ago. And we've done that a lot by moving to renewable energy. So our world headquarters runs on 100% renewable energy. Our European headquarters runs on 100% renewable energy. Our distribution center for Europe, Middle East, and Africa it has six windmills on site that generate enough electricity for the entire distribution center. We've also focused on toxics. We came up with a brand new innovation that allowed us to move from solvent-based adhesives to water-based adhesives. And when we came up with that, we reduced our VOCs, our volatile organic compounds, 95% as a company. We also know that materials are our largest toxic footprint. And we're one of the top retail purchasers of organic cotton in the world. We've been able to increase our buy for environmentally preferred materials by 130% from last year to this year. Why am I giving you all these numbers and all these stats? The reason why I'm telling you this is it's really, really important to reduce your footprint. But reducing your footprint is never going to get you to the green economy. It is great and it is necessary, but it will not move us to the green economy. And so what we realized is we needed to figure out how are we going to create product differently to move us to this green economy? What does that mean? So my team, we really went away and we tried to figure this out. How are we going to create products in this new green economy? And I have to tell you, our first thought was to take a shoe and at the end of life, plant it into the ground and watch it completely biodegrade and go back safely into nature. And that seemed like a pretty good idea. And that would be a great goal for what our products could be. But I have to tell you, when we started to analyze it, we realized it uses the same amount of energy, the same amount of water, the same amount of land mass. So for us, you know, we do not believe that in the future they're going to allow us to use that many resources to make footwear and apparel. The other thought for us was maybe, because we hear this all the time from people, why don't you just make a product that lasts forever? People make a product that lasts forever. And so we actually thought about that. We thought, okay, well, maybe we will make a product that lasts forever. And then we started to look at that and we said, you know what? Even if I made you shoes that you're going to love forever, I guarantee you after three, four years, they're going to move out of your closet. I mean, I have to tell you, I even think back on my own fashion sense when I was in high school, the leg warmers I wore. Thank God somebody didn't say that you're going to end up wearing those products forever. So really, just from a human nature standpoint, what would end up happening, you would downcycle those shoes or that apparel, and eventually it would end up in landfill. So we really tried to focus on where is it that we're trying to head as a company. And we really, our eyes got wrapped around the idea of closed-loop product what we really want to do is continue to keep materials in play. We want to take the materials from an old shoe and turn it into a new shoe. We want to take the materials from an old shirt and turn it into a new shirt. So really our philosophy for our was designers was to design in a way where you use fewer materials, you design for disassembly, and you make it easy to recycle those products. So when we finally figured out a vision on where we wanted to be, we decided to put together a video because we wanted to inspire everyone in our company to be kind of focusing on the same goal. So we showed this video, we showed it to our employees, we showed it to our designers. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to share it with you.
This is not a shoe. It's an ethos. A shoe that is reborn as a tennis court. Or a basketball. Or another shoe. A better shoe. A faster, lighter, stronger shoe. Can't still be called a shoe. Can it? When a shoe runs its course, when it has surpassed its shelf life, when it has passed its prime and seen better days, when it has pushed us to greater goals, is that it? Is that the end? Why does it have to have a shelf life? Or for that matter, why does anything else? What if we remove the shelf? What if the cycle was a closed loop where anything could become anything? A shoe into a shoe or a shoe into a shirt. A shoe can't change the world, but an ethos can. So every time I see that video, I get really excited because it, it just feels like, God, what a great idea. The idea that we can make products and not have to continue to tap into the Earth's resources, that just feels really, really right for me. But at the same time, I also realize there are some significant barriers to getting to closed loop. So you're probably wondering what my boxes are here. So I have three significant areas that are barriers for us. Number one barrier is we need to figure out what is that new low impact material, right? So I have some props flowing all the way in here. So the two largest materials that we use, the two largest textile materials, are polyester and cotton. And here's the problem. Both of these materials are flawed in the future state. Polyester is tied to a scarce resource, which is petroleum. And cotton is tied to using way too much water and way too much land mass. So let me ask you a question. How much water do you think it takes to make this one t-shirt? We calculated it by gallons. So how much water to grow the cotton, and how much water for the dyeing and finishing of this t-shirt? 500 gallons. Ooh, you're close. It's over 700 gallons for this one t-shirt. It's phenomenal when you look at that, how much water we need. We tried to put it into some kind of terms where you guys would understand. So if I was sitting in a hot tub right now, which I know would be really embarrassing, but if I was sitting in a hot tub right now and it was like five feet around and four and a half feet deep, that'd be about 500 gallons. So if that kind of helps you put it into perspective. So how much land mass is needed to grow this t-shirt? And we calculate it in square feet because we don't think people really understand acres. So how many square feet do you think you need of cotton to grow this one t-shirt? Pardon? 1,100 square feet. That's a lot of land mass and that's a lot of water for one t-shirt. And that's why at Nike, over 60% of all of our impacts are embedded in our materials. It is our largest impact for water, for waste, for toxics, and for energy. You know, a lot of times I give this presentation and somebody will say to me, oh no, you guys, energy, clearly your largest energy footprint is transporting your products all over the world. But the truth is, that's only 10% of our energy. 23% of our energy comes from manufacturing our products, and 57% of our energy is embedded in our materials. So if you look at the slide behind me, what this slide shows is land mass needed for biofuels. And what it's talking about is when, if you were to switch out all the petroleum in the United States to biofuels, what kind of area you would need based upon different crops. So you can see how soybean needs it larger land mass, then rapeseed is smaller, then corn needs smaller, then sugarcane, then algae as, a, as an experimental crop is even smaller. What we're talking about here is finding a new material that has the footprint of algae that we're able to use again and again. So barrier number two for me is cost. So I'll give you an example of this. This is our swift suit that we made for the Beijing Olympics. It is the lightest and it is the fastest swift suit we have ever made to date. But for me, the very coolest thing about it 
is it's made out of recycled polyester. And as soon as I know that I can make something high performance, that can reach the highest level, the lightest, fastest suit we've ever done out of recycled threads, that is so exciting. Because for me, you know what that says? Is that I can switch out my entire polyester buy to recycled polyester, right? And when I do that, the cool thing about it, I'm gonna reduce my water, my waste, my toxics, my energy footprint. It's all gonna be that much smaller. But I can't. Do you know why I can't? because this is about 20 to 30% more expensive than virgin polyester. But it should not be. It should not be more expensive. It should actually be cheaper. So if it has less energy, less waste, less water, less time, it should be cheaper, but it's not. And the reason why it's not cheaper is because we have not figured out a way to cost effectively recycle. So this leads me to uh, Barrier number three, which is really all about recycling. This is a product that one of our designers came up with. And it is a really, really cool product. He designed it in such a way that it's completely designed to be disassembled. I don't know if you can see kind of the thread that goes all the way around this. The entire thing is just attached by the thread, bringing everything together. And if you see the tab over here, it clearly says, do not cut this tab. Because if you cut this tab, your entire shoe will fall apart, which is great. Like for me, I get all excited about this, because then you cut it up, and it's going to go back into its pure waste stream. This is exactly what we want to create. So I'll tell you a story. I took this shoe to one of the top recyclers. And I told him this story, and I said, isn't that cool? You cut the tab, it all falls apart, and then you can give me the pure waste streams back. And you know what he said to me? He said, it's way too expensive to cut that tab. I would never cut that tab. He goes, let me tell you what's going to happen to the shoe. I'm going to throw this shoe into a huge hopper, and then I'm going to throw it in the grinder. I'm going to grind it up into a million pieces, and then I'm going to throw it, go through the sorting process to sort it back into its pure materials. And he said, this is the way it's going to work. First, it's going to go through manual sorting. Then it's going to go through mechanical sorting. Then it's going to go through water density sorting. Then it's going to go through air sorting. Then it's going to go through optical sorting. Then it's going to go to magnetic sorting. Then it's going to go through electrostatic So I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. This is the kind of stuff I cannot make up. Anyway, it just continues and continues. And I have to tell you, I am no rocket scientist. But if it takes you over six processes to figure out what kind of material you're handling, then the cost goes up and up. And if a lot of those processes are not automated, it's even more expensive. So what I do not understand is why we have not figured out a way to clearly identify materials. Why there is not some kind of a DNA marker in materials is beyond me. You know, if I wanted to be the next billionaire, and I do, if I wanted to be the next billionaire, what I would figure out is a way to clearly identify materials so that the moment they go through recycling, you know exactly what they are. There is no doubt in my mind that the future is recycling. You cannot add a third more people to the planet by 2050, and at the same time, today your resources are declining at a rate they're not being replenished. That we can continue to take materials out of play. We just cannot do that. So I want to leave you with just two thoughts. Number one, we have to figure out low impact materials. This is not just about Nike. This is about that t-shirt that you saw, right? You take that t-shirt and you multiply it by all the t-shirts on the planet. And then you think about all the consumer products and you think about all the materials in those consumer products. We have got to figure out new low impact materials. And number two, we need to figure out how to reclaim them and recycle them in a cost effective way. You know, I imagine a future where I walk into my closet, and it's a really, really small closet. It's not one of those really, really big closets. It's a really, really small closet. Because when you have one of those really, really big closets, it's because you have all that stuff in there that you don't use and that you don't wear. And it's all those resources that are going to waste. But in my closet in the future, it's going to be really, really small. Because everything in there is going to be what I love. And when I get tired of it, I'm going to take those t-shirts with me, and I'm going to go to the retailer, and I'm going to pick out a new shirt that I love, and they're going to take those old resources, and they're going to grind them up, and they're going to turn them into a new product. 
And for me, that's the only way that we're going to be able to thrive in a resource-constrained world. Thank you.